Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great Sunday. It's a great Sunday. I think we should give it up for the worship team. I enjoyed that today. Isn't that great? I uh, really appreciate y'all. And Father, we appreciate you. We thank you for your word, Lord. We ask you to bless this time together, God. May there be a challenge and a blessing in what is said here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at all these, look at all these notes. And we're starting a little later than normal. But that means, do these chairs have seat belts? Because I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And we're just going to bam. So uh, I'm excited about this passage and, and what the Lord has for us today. It's, it's a little interesting um, that, you know, <laughs> no doubt the Pharisees were a thorn in the side of Jesus. <laughs> Which that's how the term was used actually back. A thorn in the flesh was uh, usually referenced to people group that was uh, troubling you or some kind of uh, outside force that was giving you challenges. That's how the, uh, uh, the word was used. But it, realize that with something as petty as picking a head of grain that the Pharisees were technically right, not in the picking of the grain to eat or the eating of the grain, but where the apostles committed the big no now or the disciples as they put it in their hands and rubbed it together to get the husk off of it. And that's considered threshing. And so that was against the law. <laughs> okay, so... And I know that we have a big reputation here at Foothill. And so I don't want to hear any rumors of y'all on Sunday afternoon in downtown Grass Valley threshing wheat in your hands, okay? We, need, we have a reputation to maintain, okay? So that's important. Did you hear that, Bert? I don't want you downtown threshing wheat in the, on the middle of a Sunday afternoon. But they were, the Pharisees were pretty, pretty pathetic at this point and, and <laughs> had, had really lost their sight of what was really important. And we will see this as we go through these messages, but constantly yip, 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 nagging and nagging and nagging. And I think nagging is kind of like being bit to death by a duck. You know, it just, it's irritating, it's aggravating, but it really is, it, it's not going to come to anything. Eventually it did. But at this point, no. But because of their attacks on him, Jesus always sees the opportunity to create a teaching moment there. He always took the opportunity to, to say, and, and many times, many times I think this is important. There might be times that Jesus had a word of knowledge, but a lot of his assumption of what they were thinking was just common sense. These guys are, have this mindset. I know exactly what they're thinking. And, and he addressed it. And he took those opportunities to teach us. And what he teaches in these is important. But what also tells me is that Jesus lived in a hostile environment. By the end of this passage, they're devising what they can do to him. They're trying to figure out how to take him out. Okay, so that is considered a hostile environment. And even in that situation, there's something to be learned, right? And so Jesus isn't focused on the hostility. He's focused on what, how can I use this? Holy Spirit, help me to bring a lesson forth. And I think that's true with us. There are times I've been in hostile environments, not like you would think as far as persecution unto death or anything, but I've been in contrary environments where the Lord has used that to teach me something or teach other people things around us. 
But you got to have a presence of mind, and that's what we're called to do as believers, to be in peace even in the times of trial. Because in that time of peace, when everything else is hitting the fan, we are calm, we're listening to the Holy Spirit, and God, what are you trying to do here? Can you say that with me? God, what are you trying to do here? That's important for us as believers. But Jesus was in a hostile environment. And you know what? People in our culture in the United States were pretty inexperienced at that. You know, we haven't, we haven't experienced a lot of that persecution like they did. I was able to listen to a podcast last week. And there was an author on there who wrote the book, Life in a Negative World. And his name is Aaron Wren. And he's a Christian economist, and he's involved with city and urban planning. And so he had done a lot of study to write this book. Now, life in a negative world is, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go negative on you, okay? But I think it's important for us to understand a context that we live in. You guys are already reading the slides, so I might as well get to it. So... In the 1950s, 75% of the population attended church. From that point until 1994, American culture looked at Christianity favorably. They looked at it, even if they weren't Christians. I can remember in high school going to apply to jobs. And I would tell the business owner, even though he wasn't a Christian, I'd say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Because I felt that that was a positive thing and it would help me get hired. And in some cases it did. They say, hey, this kid goes to church. He's got a good family. I'm going to hire him, you know. Um, but then what happened is things started to shift. From 1994 to 2014 is a neutral period of how the church was viewed by the world. It started to wane. And that's because of social forces and whatnot, so forth and so on. From 2014 to 2024 is considered negative in how our culture views the church right now. Now, that's obviously not everybody in culture, but that is a, a, a large portion of our culture is now viewing the church as a negative thing. And I wanted to point this out, not to be a downer, but as we look at these passages to see how Jesus handled these situations, because I feel like one of my responsibilities to you as a pastor is to prepare you for what is to come. And I don't know how much worse it's going to get before a revival breaks out and turns the tide. Can I get an amen, somebody? But you know what? It could. The darkness could get darker before the light gets lighter. So we've got to be ready. And it's going to be something that we've never really experienced before in this country. We're already experiencing it. I've shared with you before that I was in China once and I got taken by police and put in jail, you know, for uh, ministering the gospel. Um, and, and that was an interesting situation to be in. But I was in a hostile environment. They weren't going to do anything to me because uh, I'm an American and they didn't want an international incident. But they took those Chinamen who were Christians and were with us, helping us spread the gospel in that area. And they beat them to no end. I mean, it was tough. It was tough. Hmm. <laughs> But we talked to those guys the next day and they said, hey, do you need some time off? Do you want to go away? And they said, no, we're going back to preach the gospel. Because that's the spirit of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the removal of fear. Amen. That was for free. That wasn't in my notes. Amen. Now, keep in mind that whole period of time from the 1950s until present time, even though the way the world viewed the church changed and shifted, that whole period of time, the church was in decline, numerically, statistically. Okay? It's just, let's be real. 
Now, we're going to go ahead and move through the passage and come back to this point at the end of the message. In verse 3, Jesus brings up the story of David, how they go into the house of God. They're hungry. David's soldiers are hungry in 1 Samuel 21. And, and they get the bread that was consecrated for the priests. And David eats it himself and gives it to his soldiers because they're hungry. And there was no consequence for that. Nobody got in trouble. Nobody. Because it was about what the people needed. And that's what we need to bear in mind. You always have this thing where there are the sacred rhythms of the church, even in the New Testament as well as the Old, but there are these sacred rhythms in the church and they're for us. They're not for the sake of the sacred rhythms. And what happens here in this is Jesus makes the declaration in verse five, so this, oh no, I'm sorry. In Mark 2, verse 27, then he says to them, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's an important point to understand because the things of God, the rhythms that God has put in front of us in our faith, taking communion often, that's for us. It's not because we are trying to uh, achieve some kind of a quota or oh, I took uh, communion uh, X amount of times in 2023. There's no quotas there. The Sabbath is not about the rules and it's, it's always about you, the people. It's not about setting aside one day a week and making a, a trip to church to meet some kind of religious quota. No, it's about you. God has established this as the best thing for you, those sacred rhythms that we have in our faith. So we see here that Jesus is making that statement. He has pulled up out of the religiosity that the Pharisees are getting, trying to suck everybody into. And he's saying, no, this is about us. This is about who we are. Then Jesus makes an interesting declaration. So, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So this is the context. And I have a question for you. Is Jesus still Lord of the Sabbath? <sighs> Better believe he is. Kind of puts a, a little focus on that, doesn't it? Why is Jesus Lord of the Sabbath? Did Jesus observe the Sabbath? Yes, he did. I'll answer that for you in case you didn't know that. These rhythms are for us. They're for us to be healthy and, and rest, stay restored and stay refreshed in the things of God. Evidently, God thinks Sabbath is very important for us. Now, I take my Sabbath on Mondays because Sunday is a work day for me. And just a little practical instruction. I sit behind a desk almost all week. So for me, something enjoyable for me is to get out in the yard. It's very refreshing for me. Now, I'm not going to move two cords of wood on the Sabbath. Uh, I, I still believe in that day of rest thing, but what's refreshing for me? And I know that a lot of Christians look at the Sabbath as being something that gets in the way and kind of inconvenient. But to Jews, it is a, a day that is looked forward to all week and it is filled with Sabbath delights is the term that Jews use. <coughs> So I think there's something there for us. This isn't going to be a full-blown message on the Sabbath today, but I want to encourage you. And I don't do it religiously or can, if, if there's a Monday that rolls around and something comes up and I got to do it, I go do it, you know, but I do try to observe that time on Mondays to be still before the Lord, be relaxed, be refreshed. And uh, then do some things that I like. I try to do things that are fun. That's why I tell you guys after church, go do something fun. Because it's the Sabbath. And there are Sabbath 
delights there for us. So even in the presence of healings and miracles, they still devised evil against Jesus. Even in the presence of those who would deny the truth and hate you, there will always be those who want to hear it. That's important. Sometimes when we face opposition and people are coming against us, we might have a tendency to hone in on that and it might trouble us. But remember that in that moment where people are opposing you, there are others that want to hear the truth. They want to hear what you're saying. They want to be a part of the love that you are expressing to them. This passage goes on. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night there praying. And I just want to stop here in light of this and say that Jesus took Sabbaths. That's, it might not have been on the Sabbath day, but Jesus took Sabbaths. He went and got away and, and attempted and did stay filled up with the things of God. Filled up with the spirit. So I want to point out three life principles that we see in these passages that we see modeled in the life of Jesus that we can take from this point forward and really try to apply them to our lives. And this one right here is important. Jesus stayed filled with the spirit and the word and the Sabbath becomes more and more important to us when we think about this in this context. If we are going to be people, believers, that stay filled with the word of God, stay filled with the presence of God, then the Sabbath becomes very a very important rhythm for us. Sorry, I'm stumbling on my words. A very important rhythm for us. And I think Jesus modeled that. Also, too, there are times I think Jesus got away because holy being around all that unholy probably needs to get away and just get a good Holy Spirit scrub once in a while. <laughs> and I, I really think Jesus needed that. Then it says in verse 13, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12. Now, this brings up another important life principle being displayed by Jesus. He had fellowship and ministry with large groups of people. But then he had his 12. He had his bros. And that, that is intimate. That is some intimate fellowship right there. When you get together with 12 people, he even had his three, Peter, James, and John. But, but here we're talking about this community and how powerful it is. The life principle is Jesus stayed in intimate fellowship with his disciples. And there were times Jesus asked them to pray for him. That's pretty heavy if you think about it. So one, the first life principle was stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Number, and, and the word, and number two, is to stay in intimate fellowship with people who are close to you. Now, do you know who your posse is? I mean, do you know that? Yeah, you do? You got your posse? Can you think of who they are? The people that you get together with on a regular basis, they're close to you, and they keep you focused on the things that are important. I got a couple of them that I get together with on a regular basis. And I went for years of my life not having that. And I'm telling you, it's better with it than without it. So I would challenge, if there was a challenge that went forth this morning in this message, it would be locate your posse. And chances are, you're going you're gonna to have to throw it together yourself. Because people, the average Christian does not think this way. This is different thinking. 
Who's your posse? Who do you get together with? We got a posse, right, Bert? Thursday mornings. We got a posse, you know? But, but who are the people that you have in your mind that are close to you that you want to fellowship with and you think this is a good construct? Doesn't have to be 12. You don't have to have 12. Three or four is fine. But who's your posse that you get together with and start creating that rhythm? It could just be once a month. You get together for coffee, talk about life, pray for each other, have some scripture to read. Who's your posse? That's important. So then Jesus in, in um, Matthew chapter five, I'm gonna shift over to that for the Beatitudes because it's such a beautiful rendition of this uh, passage. But in Matthew chapter five, we're gonna go through the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So here we go. Now, Kenneth Wiest in the Wiest translation translates this this way, and I love this. For blessed, he says, spiritually prosperous. And for poor in spirit, he says, those who are destitute and helpless in the realm of the spirit. So spiritually prosperous are the destitute and helpless in the realm of the spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you think about this in the context, this is pre-salvation and post-salvation. That's what these beatitudes are. They are people, people who don't know Christ, and then what happens when we know Christ? And what are the changes in our lives that take place? Now, that might not be, of course, I'm no Greek scholar, so Kenneth Weiss might know what he's talking about. But from what I've seen, I think that's a little liberal translation of this verse that I probably wouldn't say is actually accurate to what the Greek is saying. But I will say this, that before Christ... You were destitute and helpless in the realm of the spirit. <laughs> and after Christ, you are now spiritually prosperous. So the translation is accurate from that standpoint. The next verse says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. That's the confirmation of this statement. Verse five, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Matthew 23, verse 12 says, when we humble ourselves, we will be exalted. Verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jeremiah says in chapter 29, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with your whole heart. That is powerful. We, isn't it nice to know there's something we can hunger and thirst for and that God's going to deliver every time? That's righteousness. That's powerful. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Matthew chapter 6 says, when you forgive others, you will be forgiven. Right? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Paul told Timothy, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a clean conscience, and a sincere faith, right? That's, that's what happens when we are in Christ. And then he goes on to say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You notice every time Paul greets the church, he says, peace be unto you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're carriers of peace. And then the last one gets interesting and it causes us to boomerang back to a conversation that I was having at the beginning of this message. And it also reveals a third life principle. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute here. In verse 6, he was saying, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness because you're going to be filled. 
And then in verse 10, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of that righteousness. Hello? It's a question. Unrighteousness? No persecution. Or righteousness and persecution. <laughs> Think about that. Because I do believe, and we need to prepare our hearts, church. I think COVID was a blip on the radar compared to what we're in for. I think there's going to be some real persecution, but as God, see how much God loves you and how perfect his love is. Think about how perfect God's love is. And he's basically telling us, I want you to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it will be a source of persecution to you. That's important. I believe we're coming into a time here. And we need to prepare our hearts because I think people got taken by surprise. They got taken by surprise on how to deal with some of this stuff that's going on in our culture. And it, you know, we got taken by surprise. It took us a while, but I think the church is kind of, the dust has settled and we figured out how to respond to some things and how to, how to respond accurately, biblically, and in love and declare the truth in love. But that, you can do everything right and you're still gonna be persecuted. Did Jesus do anything wrong? No. It was perfect. I never really understood this until I watched the decline of our culture in the last 10 years. It has blown my mind how much and how the world just, uh, our culture ex has exchanged the truth for a lie, like Romans chapter 1 says, and, and blatantly declares lies over and over again when they're obviously lies. But if you say it enough, often enough and loud enough, people start to believe it. But here's the third life principle, declare the truth in love and do not back down. Be tough. Love them. Speak it in love, but do not back down. Amen. Take, your posse. Take your posse with you. There you go. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so Derek Thompson, a writer for The Atlantic, has this observation more than one quarter of Americans now identify as atheists, agnostics, or religiously unaffiliated. According to a new survey of 5,600 U.S. adults by the Public Religion Research Institute. And I just want to say, that is a big sample. 5,600 people, that is a big sample for a survey. This is the highest level of non-religiosity in the poll's history. Two-thirds of non-believers, two-thirds of those non-believers were brought up in nominally religious households. Two-thirds. That means they were raised in some kind of a religious context. But there is, uh, uh, who said, or. Er, Amber was talking earlier about the deconstruction thing. It's really a big deal. I've taken uh, two of my close friends to lunch over the last week that have deconstructed. And God's put me in their life to, to, to try. And, and I know that we talk. I, I just want to say something here. I know that we've talked about the goal is this year is for everyone to make a disciple. I'm taking that personally myself too. I'm taking that personally. And I know, I, and I told you, I'm not gonna stand at the back door on the last Sunday of the year and take a role. Okay, did you make a disciple this year? 
Here's all I'm asking. Pray and ask the Lord to lead you to where he, he's already working. Ask him, who is it in your life that you can start getting together with and trying to build some kind of a relationship? I know that a lot of families have, have gone out of the church and have not returned since COVID. Now, there's an abundance of opportunities for us to call our friends and say, hey, let's go get some coffee together. And then uh, over a period of time and a few meaningful relationships, hey, do you want to read scripture together? And just start discipling them back into the body of Christ. Does that make sense? But what I'm asking you to do is pray. Well, Pastor Mark, I don't know. My lifestyle is such that I just have no idea who in the world I could connect with and start discipling them. Well, you know what? We have a God of the impossible, right? So let's just believe God in faith. You might not see how it can happen, but pray and ask the Lord and be sensitive to his leading to you on how you can begin to create a relationship and start discipling other people. He goes on to say, two-thirds of non-believers were brought up in at least a nominally, nominally religious household. Now, so think about this conversation. We have the world that has increasingly become more negative to the church. And Derek Thompson, who wrote this article, is an agnostic. Now listen to what he says here on this next statement. As an agnostic, I have spent most of my life thinking about the decline of faith in America in mostly positive terms. Organized religion seemed to me beset by scandal and entangled in noxious politics. So I thought, what is there really to mourn? Only in the past few years, I have come around to a different view. Maybe religion, for all of its faults, works like a retaining wall to hold back the destabilizing pressure of American hyper-individualism. He's seeing something there as an unbeliever. He sees our, our society declining. Which threatens to swell and spill over in its absence. So we are in a season where we don't know where this is going. But we have three examples from Jesus. Have a rhythm of spending time with God and staying filled up in the spirit and filled up in his word. Observe your Sabbath. However you want to do that, go to the word, see what standards are there, but we have to have that rhythm in our lives where we can stay filled up in the things of God. Engage in close fellowship with your posse. Figure out who those people are and create that rhythm of getting together with them. And then number three, Declare the truth in love and do not back down. Be that retaining wall against the sin that is in our culture. I think that's a good challenge for us today, amen? amen. And it's amazing that we see those three principles in the word here as clear as day as examples for us on how we should live our lives. Let's all stand. If you need prayer, there will be people up here to pray with you and to encourage you. 
If you, you know, it's good for us to confess our sins to one another. If you feel the need to repent, there will be people up here to pray with you and to ask for the Lord's forgiveness. There will be people up here to do that with you. If you feel like you need to make a commitment to God, I've let things get a little loose and I need to get serious. There will be people up here to pray with you. Everybody say this with me. Stay filled. Get my posse. And declare the truth in love. Do not back down important. How will they hear if there's not a preacher? Right? Right. Father, we love your word, God. We love you. We love your word. We pray, Father, that you will lead us and guide us into the truth that we need for this season, God. Who's our posse? Who are the people that we gather with? A home group, a prayer group, what is that rhythm of Sabbath that you would like to establish in my life? And give us the courage and the strength to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might and to take up the armor of God in this generation, Father. We thank you for this, Lord. I bless this congregation with this beautiful Sabbath day, Lord. In Jesus' name. Somebody say it. Amen. Amen. Remember, there's prayer up here for you. Don't forget to sign up for Cinco de Mayo and have fun today. <laughs>